I'm going to welcome Zach Carr to present tonight on the Circles program. Oh, just an overview because I understand there's a lot uh, to this, but this way it'll give the parents some idea of what to expect and how best to support our young people if they, um, if and when they hopefully attend uh, Zach's presentation for the young people coming up um, in a few months. So, Zach, thank you. Tell us about Circles. Yeah, about well, well, and I don't know how many of you are, you know, currently connected to someone in the Building Independence Program, but through Peace, but that is one of the classes that I teach. Um, we have this tool, the Circles Program, that we're going to be utilizing within that, that group that meets on Thursday nights. Um, they're all young adults, and they've done a fantastic job of, you know, utilizing Zoom and staying connected to one another, um, but, you know, Everything we're going to be using in the circles program continues to be issues for the majority. Um, there's at least, um, you know, a, a handful of things for everybody that I'm sure we'll address for them, and hopefully on a very individualized basis. Um, the first thing I want to tell you is that this is not an advertisement for James Stansfield, um, because that's when I was putting it together. I'm like, gosh, you know, he's going to hire me to sell this program. Um, and hopefully that is not how you perceive it. Um, what you'll find is that it's a, it's a generic tool that can be adapted for many different individuals. Um, it has a, a basis in relationship development, proximity, um, and we're gonna get into some of the details of it. I've created a PowerPoint for you tonight. Um, but I want you to know that when I'm presenting that, that you're still encouraged to ask questions, especially if they're pertinent to whatever slide we're on. And if not, I'll ask you to try to um, save that as we get, I'm sure we'll cover that topic um, and it might be more relevant at, at a later date. Feel free to use the chat box um, or you can raise your hand. It is going to be more difficult for me to see your hands raised when I'm sharing because the screen of all of you gets much smaller for me. So, um, but I will try to get to every one of your questions and we'll also have time at the end for that as well. Um, so just to start off here, I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and this is kind of a generic, but I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to look this up at all. And this is the initial James Stansfield cool video. Our best selling cool Just because they can really give you a brief overview in a minute that's probably better to cover it than I can. Circle Special Education's most popular video series has been updated. The James Stanfield Company proudly presents an all-new Circles Level 1 based on the award-winning social boundaries paradigm. The new Circles Level 1 teaches students how to safely navigate the social world, now with more relationships and guidelines for internet safety. Circles teaches students about the different types of relationships they have with people and what levels of intimacy or closeness are appropriate with each. Keep your students safe from abuse by teaching them appropriate touch, talk, and trust for each of the people in their life using the Circles paradigm. Visit us at stanfield.com today to learn how you can buy the new. So let me exit out of that. And I will show you what I've put together for you here. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, well, it's labeled intimacy and relationships. But as those of you who came on a little earlier realized, there are so many related issues um, that fall under that umbrella. Um, the Circles program was originally created in 1983. I've been using it myself in my practice since about 88. Um, and I can tell you the changes are more in the sense of technology use, um, using now video, uh, in 
incorporating current issues, cultural differences, incorporating um, you know the, the use of social media and all of those other aspects where people have either relationships or uh, self-evaluation. Some of the tools they use for self-evaluation now have drastically changed um, in the last you know, 10, 15 years. So it, the curriculum was designed specifically for individuals with intellectual disabilities, autism, other mental health concerns. Um, but I also find that it's also helpful for lots of people who have just visual learning needs. And it can help with you know, taking some abstract concepts, you know, some of those ideas that are in the hidden curriculum, um, this is a good tool that can be utilized for that. So what I love about it personally is the flexibility. Um, those of you who've met me, know me, I like to individualize everything. Uh, I don't feel there's any generic tool that works for everybody. So that's why I'm not selling <laughs> this program. Um, is because you, you still have to have the skills and knowledge of the person um, that you're going to be working with in order to support them best, even using this tool. So I've found that I've used it in lots of different areas that I'm sure I'll give you examples of as we go through this. Um, currently, they have uh, app options. So as far as supporting, you know, uh, if you have children, students, young adults uh, that you support, um, the technology uh, is also available for iPads, Android, um, you know, apps on phones, uh, not just, you know, where you have to have it stationary. So it's a lot more flexible in that respect. Um, the instructor obviously can personalize lesson plans to the depth and level of participant understanding and values. One of the reasons why I was excited to have you guys, you know, interact with me tonight is uh, you're going to have my contact information if you haven't already. If people you care about are going to be attending my class through building independence, that you could give me information about values. You could give me information about, um, you know, situations they've experienced or you perceive they're going to experience. Um, if, if you're, again, if you're comfortable with trusting me with that information so that I can incorporate it uh, for some in a direct way and for others in a non-direct way. Um, often it's utilizing examples to share the information without, you know, pinpointing anyone in the group, but then it allows them to be able to talk about it openly. Building Independence is a pretty unique group because uh, they've been, they've bonded through their you know two hour sessions every week together for you know a couple of years now online practically um, and many years in person uh, for those who've been with us that in that group that long. So the ability to interact has drastically improved, um, but there's still a lot to know and learn because our our, our world is so confusing and. Uh, we run into these kinds of situations in our group where there's, you know, issues, whether it be rumors or confusion or, um, you know, even boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, significant other type relationships um, where they're still, um, you know, maturing. And I don't know a ton of, you know, neurotypical adults who can't benefit from, you know, new skills when it comes to communication and relationships, etc. I think all of us have a deficit with one thing or another. Um, you know, my, my mother and I still have these conversations to this day of what do you need to do to improve your communication with others? So, which is quite, you know, it's probably unique, but, you know, she's working on acceptance uh, right now is that that's, you know, accepting that people have different opinions or views, even though she disagrees and accepting the situation that she's in and, you know, not having the independence of driving and how she has to rely on other people. So all of that still brings us back to relationship change and having to adapt to those, you know, differences in life that, that you know, we may not prepare for. So I don't find that you know, the, the issues are different. It's the teaching styles and learning styles that are different. Um, 
when it comes to communication, you know, not cutting people off, understanding, you know, social norms and graces. Um, but I think utilizing our own examples. So if you're supporting people at home or in the community, uh, using your own examples of what it is that you're working on, what it is that you want to do better at, um, you know, how, how is that? What, what are the topics that are difficult for you? And some of them are very, uh, very deep emotional topics, you know, uh, approaching, you know, death. How do you talk about that? How do you accept it? How do you, you know, support others who've experienced that in their, you know, close circle? So we get into a lot of very um, deep uh, concepts that are, I think, are surprising to a lot of, you know, parents and professionals that whatever is, you know, whatever's happening in the world, that's something that's available for us to talk about. Uh, as you know, many filters get turned off when you're in trusted groups. Um, and trying to teach that, you know, when you're in a trusted group and when do you need to turn a filter on and what that filter is. So I'll show you a little, a few more examples of that as we move forward. So uh, three of the, the main topics are what we call the three T's. So the first one is touch. So what kind and amount of bodily contact? So when you, when you're, um, perceiving touch. When is the right touch? What touch do you accept? How big is your personal bubble? Um, what people in your um, different circles, what level of touch do you, are you comfortable with them? And, you know, as you mature, your, your touch, your personal bubble may change as you develop and change. And um, it may get bigger and it may get smaller at different points in your life or different what we call um, current status. So one of the things we're going to get into is the current status, how you're feeling today. Your touch may be different than, today than it was yesterday based on what you experienced. And likewise, significant people in your life may have that same experience. So how do we adapt to these changes in touch? Um, not to mention health and safety um, a related touch. Um, things such as, you know, where are your personal and private spaces? When can you touch somebody's head or face versus shoulder or leg? Um, what are appropriate um, kinds of touch and who are the people or in who, which per people in which circle are people you would touch in those areas? Um, I often use the uh, barbecue apron as something you put on. And if you wrap that barbecue apron, or apron and tie it around your backside, pretty much everything the barbecue apron touches are, are things you shouldn't touch. So just using those kinds of visuals paired with some of these other tools that, you know, Stansfield has produced uh, are just other ways to try to communicate and demonstrate, you know, what's appropriate touch based on the level or circle in which that, you know, person in your, um, in your relationship is. So touch can go on and on and on. And like I mentioned earlier in kind of the preface about, you know, pets, appropriate touch with pets, appropriate touch with strange animals. Um, so a lot of health and safety aspects as well as um, social communication uh, comes into this big topic of touch. Talk is the next one. So the subject matter and the language formality. So what language is appropriate to use with which people in which circle? Uh, understanding you know, tone and directives versus whining and questioning um, versus topic in what environment versus volume. So you can imagine this is a huge uh, category in and of itself. So when are you, what is yelling and how do you define it? How does it make you feel? Or is that part of your culture? Uh, I think in assessing these kinds of situations, you end up with individuals who don't, you know, deal well with one type of communication or they're just accustomed to one type of communication. And it's not right or wrong, but when you have a communication partner that that's not a familiar or comfortable manner, then you're going to have to learn why is it different and how can we respect and accept that. 
And so we'll label often within the circles program, who is who? Sometimes people or individuals that you have relationships with can float between different categories um, based on different aspects, whether that be touch and communication. So maybe they're someone that you, you know, have lots of communication and you feel like you can tell lots of different things with lots of emotion, but you don't touch uh, in that same way. So where would they fall within that circle if they meet certain criteria, but they don't meet other criteria? So sometimes individuals, I will border their, their pictures with multiple colors because they actually in different areas, they can uh, fluctuate, which is not something that is in the curriculum. So that's part of that individualization aspect of using these tools. Um, the next one is trust. So what degree of emotional reliability and, and physical safety so when you think about trust, sometimes we trust people with identification. We trust people who are teachers or who are police officers or who are doctors or, you know, who's your neighbor, even though you don't know them as well, but you see them all the time. But maybe you don't have those kinds of conversations with intimate details. So who do you tell what to? Why is it okay to have a um, to go to a doctor's appointment and remove all your clothes when that person's a stranger. Whereas all the other individuals in my life that fit into that stranger category, you know, I get, I, I get, people get offended when I just, you know, put my hand up my shirt to, to scratch. So all of these kinds of unique idiosyncratic uh, social norms are things that we discuss in while we utilize this program. So trust can be where you've been, you know, physically, emotionally hurt, where it's your dreams and goals, whether it's your, um, you know, arguments with family and close friends, whether it's, you know, how someone appreciates your haircut or not and how that makes you feel. It, it isn't as generic as we'd like it to be. We often like to pigeonhole certain things as topics that we're uncomfortable with talking about. However, many of the people I support, the, the topics that they struggle with um, that, you know, breach trust for them can be very unique as to how they, you know, conceptualize it, how they interpret it. So getting down to you know, what that individual experiences uh, in trust. So I know that I put my foot in my mouth many times with people just trying to um, share with them, you know, different kinds of scenarios. I'll give you, I, 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 because we're all adults here, many of us in the profession. So the other day I was working with a, a, a teen and he was struggling with um, his father's love for him and the difference between one was the talk part, the communication versus yelling, um, the intimidation versus roles like fatherhood versus friend, um, all of these types of things. And it, we, we came down to this situation where he was trying to understand if his if he had an interaction with his father and it felt negative, did, was that an extreme reaction? Was he feeling like he was unloved? So he had the ability to go from you know love and elation to you know you know on the edge of suicide, um, trying to please and trying to interpret when somebody's pleased. Um, so we got into this discussion of unconditional love, and that parents will always want the very best for you and that I'm in his life because his dad wants the very best for him and he wants him to have another outlet to communicate with and of course I made a fool of myself by luckily the the, the young man didn't know what I referenced but I said you know even Jeffrey Dahmer's parents loved him now for those of you in my generation you of course go oh gosh yeah where, where did that come from 
But then I had to go into this explanation of, okay, well, what did you mean by that? Well, sometimes people can do some pretty horrific things and their parents still love them. They don't love their behavior, but they love them. And so I can imagine that, you know, in this, in this training and the use of this curriculum is that we're going to continue to breach these kinds of ideas. Um, and of course I shared with his, to his dad and he thought that was hilarious. Um, and so now I'm sure it's going to be a running gag in their family household that, you know, at least you're not a serial killer, more or less. I think it's a, it's a good barometer for which to, uh, for, to measure your behavior that uh, your dad's still going to love you even when you do these things that, you know, may be inappropriate and maybe, you know, hurtful or what have you, but he's going to love you either way. So obviously Jeffrey Dahmer is going to be way out on the stranger danger uh, circle with regards to this tool. Um, so anyway, touch, talk, and trust. We call them the three T's. This is one of those kinds of uh, messages that you can use, you know, with your young people. So in helping them to evaluate where people fit, how important are they, how safe are they, um, and you can break it down pretty si simply. So hopefully when they, they complete this, they'll know exactly what you're talking about when you mention touch, talk, and trust. So the circles is a quantity and quality of the three T's based on the relationships within each circle. So you talk about how frequently and um, what is the value of each one of these subjects with the individual and how they fit into each circle on your own individualized plan. So just, just one, uh, one subject that we get into for each one of these levels. So as you see the levels here, so the first level is gonna be the one at the top. So you see the very small circle and that is about the individual themselves. So some of the messages we try to teach are I'm the most important person in my world. So if you're not taking care of yourself, then it's hard to have quality relationships with other people. So a part of it is about that self-evaluation. What do you like about yourself? What do you not like about yourself? Uh, where do you uh, where do you create these you know comparisons and contrasting to decide who you think you should be versus who you are? Um, and then also, no one touches me unless I want to be touched. So knowing that you are entitled to your body and your your surroundings, um, your uh, personal bubble is yours, and you determine what that is. But then you go into all of the details of what everybody else's is. So recognizing that people have different personal space requirements. So typically we color the center color purple. Now in an individualized context, I do not require them to do the colors in the same color. Um, I know in classrooms, when you're doing an entire classroom, um, that it's helpful for it to correspond, say to the the big uh, visual behind me. But if you don't have that big visual, then what's the difference as to what color um, people choose to use in their in their rainbow there? So uh, it's the center circle. It contains only one person yourself. So basically, we discuss your uh, specialness, uh, your autonomy, the independence you have, um, and then everything else outside of you is you know what other people measure. So what your point of view is of yourself, what uh, your perspective is, your style, your relationships, your spirituality, uh, et cetera. So again, it can be a very deep um, value-based discussion uh, for people to talk about what are those most important things and what makes them them. Then you get into the next one they call the big hug circle. So it's where those people who, you know, share intimate space with you. So usually there's just a few people in that circle, uh, even though a lot of people are very huggy individuals. So sometimes uh, the, the one of the biggest challenges here is to help people to understand uh, that other people aren't huggy that they don't want to greet you that way every time and what are the alternatives. So a lot of it is not necessarily what space do you put people in, but how do you change the physical boundaries with each individual, even though you love them dearly. So um, basically the immediate family is the circle uh, also where the, the sweetheart is. Let me hop up for a minute. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So 
on people's individual sheets. They have they can put a sweetheart there next to them. So someone who is a significant other that works on the bigger the bigger circle back here. So the reason why they removed it from this particular sheet is because that not everybody has that person and they didn't want to point that out as a norm that it's, you know, again, individualized. So not everybody has that person and um, that it's something you can choose to or not have. Um, so that big, the big hug circle is those people who have intimate space with you. Um, usually it's immediate family uh, and that significant other. So trying to help them understand the different kinds of touch that are still uh, appropriate with each one of these groups. So that one is the most intimate. The next one we call is the faraway hugs. I always use it as a side hug. So uh, in some of the videos you'll see, um, we, we go into the difference, you know, when someone comes up to shake your hand and then you give them a hug and that awkward exchange, um, you know, someone tries to hug you, but you hug them with one arm um, and how to interpret those kinds of reactions as you figure out, you know, is it that they don't like me or they're not huggers um, and how to have that conversation, depending on how well you know them, um, you know, how to get through that awkwardness. So it, it, it becomes much more um, idiosyncratic, I think, um, based on the interaction. So uh, it's always a fun discussion to have, you know, for uh, in every group, you get the, the gamut of different individuals and their comfort level with physical touch. So also what to do when these very, very close people in your life move away when these close people say go off to college and you know what contact do you have now that you can't touch them now fortunately we have things like facetime and zoom etc that makes things a lot easier than it used to be when i was trying to teach this uh, when writing letters and sending photos was the only option um, but one thing that I think came out of that experience for me was to recognize that a lot of the individuals that I supported when, you know, very, very preferred intimate people in their lives just up and left because they were paid people and how that person then became perceived as, you know, what you would see as someone as a missing person uh, that, you know, would have been on the, you know, the wall at the post office or on a milk carton back in the day. Um, and how that trauma effect uh, and, and ongoing effects on the individuals that we support. So trying to, you know, stay in relationships that are valuable, um, even when you're a paid person and recognize that, you know, everyone is just human. And so how do you make these contacts and how do you develop these relationships with individuals and, and maintain them? And so that's a big question that comes up in every class I've ever done um, when it comes to people leaving and disappearing and, you know, or I left high school where I used to see my friends every day, but now I don't. And, you know, I used to get hugs every day. Now I don't. So sometimes it's um, very, uh, I want to say depressive, but it's, it's isolating um, when you start getting into some of these topics. So, what I warn um, families and professionals about is that you have to pay attention for these signs and symptoms if they're not mentioning it after they've been in classes like this. So these can be negative aspects. They also can say, hey, where's my, where's my sweetheart? Um, you know, I saw so-and-so kissing someone down the street and she, I don't know, she looked kissable to me, so maybe I should go try it. Um, so sometimes it's those boundaries. Well, she seemed open to kissing with him. How come she's not open to kissing with me? Um, so there, the, a lot of details can come out of this where we have to individualize and prepare individuals for how they might interpret the information they're given. So obviously you can see that um, I've, I've had a lot of experience with a lot of the drawbacks as well and some of the repair work you have to do when you start prevent, presenting information. Um, you have to be ready to, you know, back up and really give the details that, you know, each individual didn't pick up on and how they can, how they can learn that. So uh, as you move into the next level of shaking hands with my acquaintances, well, how many people do you walk by in a day? 
So if you say, you know, you're out, you know, shopping at the mall, well, God, I could have shaken a thousand hands. So how are you selective? How do you decide who you shake hands with? Um, who are your acquaintances? Every time I see the neighbor come out the door, should I run over there and shake their hand or is, is it rude? Um, so there's a, a lot of details in every one of these levels. Um, so, and what is the best handshake? So now with COVID, you've got to incorporate a lot of different um, information that, of course, isn't in the curriculum. So it's just a banner on the website at this point. <laughs> so you have to individualize that, too. And then you have um, belief systems around hygiene and vaccination and all of those factors that are, are current issues um, that also will come up in these kinds of trainings. So whether you're knuckle bumping or I like to call it chicken winging where you're, you know, tapping elbows or, you know, I, I'm a one to like to just, you know, bow and, you know, say hi, good to meet you. Uh, but I still have lots of people reaching out to shake my hand. And so how do you deal with that um, these days is also unique and, and not specific to, you know, anyone with a diagnosis. It's all of us. So. I think those, that's what makes this so valuable is that we all go through things together. Uh, waving to children. Um, another thing I've had to approach with a lot of individuals I support is um, they find that children are more affectionate and social, but the parents get really standoffish and uncomfortable, et cetera. So I've tried to support a lot of people with saying, gosh, you have a really well-behaved child. So that the initiation is to the adult and then to the child so that you don't look like a standard creeper, as they like to call it. Um, but how do you deal with that socialization when the kid's waving at you? Um, and then if you wave back and you're a bearded man, now the parents are all you know, worried about you. Um, so how can you address that when those things happen? Um, Anyway, there, there's a lot of nuances to every one of these, as you can see. Um, the next one is a necessary touch with service providers or health workers. We talked about who sees you naked, who does what. Um, in residential, I used to have everybody, when you had to do a medical procedure or something along those lines, that you wore a white coat um, to recognize that we were different people in different roles. Um, and that if you were going to help somebody hygienically, you should have gloves on and you should wear a coat and you should do all of the things that a perpetrator probably would not do. Um, so trying to point out some of the details um, that I think a lot of people don't think about when you have, say, paid providers and the paid provider comes in on day one and has to assist you with hygiene or bathing. Uh, it's really a very confusing uh, approach because we what we show them here about physical contact then all is for naught because we breach it ourselves just by bringing in paid people. So uh, those are all discussions that have to be had and pointed out and, and recognize that they can request. If they have the ability to request how they want to be touched and by who and uh, in what you know, and when to leave doors open and all of these things are all very, very important for their own self-protection. Um, likewise, strangers. So I know people who have a criteria for when does a person move from a stranger to an acquaintance? How many times do I have to see the person and greet the person and say hi to the person and memorize their name? And when do they memorize my name? And so when does that person actually move through that criteria? And thus, how many times as an acquaintance that I see them say at my local restaurant with their name tag on. So I know their name, I sit in the same spot and visit with them. So when do they become you know, a friend? And what is the criteria for that? So we go through a lot of those kinds of things because many people will say, well, that person is really interesting to me. So I'm gonna follow them so that I can talk to them five times today so that they can move from a stranger to an acquaintance. So then we get into stocking issues and all of those kinds of confusing things because they got some information, but not all the information. So I'm going to reiterate over and over again, it's the individualization piece of this that makes it successful. It's not the tools themselves. 
So the whole reason I saw, which was most valuable to discuss this program, was to communicate the level of intricacy. Uh, I think the level of support and the, the openness to listen and attend to what is or isn't working when you're getting into some of these details. Uh, and being available to people and giving them the time for which to bring up questions. Um, often I use the word marinate, that they have to take this home and, li and live it and, and you know, ponder on it for a week. And then they'll come back a week later with ideas and thoughts and um, things that they experienced while they were in the community or their home, etc. So I haven't seen any hands. Are there any questions before I move on to the next? No, all good. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna change gears here. So this is kind of the the explanation of each one of these levels. So what is important? So first of all, the purple level uh, is self, and we did we discuss self love. We discuss self honesty and what people self talk or the things that are in their head tell them, and is that real or is that not real? Uh, Self-reliance, meaning can they trust themselves? Do they make good decisions for themselves? Where do they need support? What do they need to learn? Um, what are their goals with regards to those um, topics? And then overall emotional tone, their self-esteem. Where do they get the information? Where do, who, whose approval do they seek? So if you can see just how much time could any one of us spend on just mastering that? So you can see where the curriculum can just go over and over and over, because as soon as you add the next layer and you haven't done the work on self or the person doesn't really, you know, hasn't started it before, you know, today, it's hard to move on to the next one and really understand your relationship to family. So family members, step family, foster family, grandparents, servant parents, you know, anyone, you, you, they could be living with, um, you know, in a, in a group home situation, et cetera. So there's a lot of variability. So loving, but not romantic. And that's a real fine line to identify is why when I, you know, love this person and hug this person, how come when I see it on TV, it looks different. I find today, that media is much more influential into people's perspectives than it's ever been. They are inundated with visual information that doesn't have any explanations. And rarely do they have the option to discuss what they're watching. So I find that a lot of that information, which is not real, um, you know, what's on television or on social media is not what life is often like. And so that becomes the goal or the benchmark, and it's unre unrealistic benchmarks. So uh, the next one is talk with family, so any subject and even personal. But you'll find that different roles within the family hold different topics. So what I can talk with my mom or my dad about, I might talk about different things with a grandparent or a brother or sister. Um, and so I have them identify or itemize what those ideas are, as well as what are the barriers. So why can't you talk to your father about that? You know, what's the barrier for that? Is it just because it, how comfort is or it's, you know, how that person communicates back? And do you find that in other relationships? If they have that communication style, do you notice that, okay, well, that person wouldn't get the trust in that area because they sound similar, they look similar? So we start talking about how we evaluate people. Uh, and the, <clears throat> the last one, although full trust isn't always apparent, um, the last one is loving and nurturing feeling. So identifying how and what kind of behavior um, you absorb what that feels nurturing. So what are those, you know, measures that you see and where did that come from? Do you get it from, you know, oh, grandma was the most nurturing person, but my parents aren't that nurtured. So, or vice versa. I mean, I've been trying to get my grandparents to hug me, but that's just not who they are. And why is that? Do you know, do they not love me? 
So there's a lot, there's a lot of depth to each and every one. So then you get into the sweetheart person. So, um, you know, again, now you, there, there's a huge can of worms when it comes to obviously romance and what's appropriate romance. And, uh, I get so many questions regarding, you know, what is the difference between uh, dating and, uh, you know, uh, a steady boyfriend, girlfriend, partner to what is, you know, a being exclusive and not seeing anybody else to, you know, when do I give them a promise ring or propose or marriage and um, it opens up a lot of different discussions around, you know, what one wants and how to get there. Um, and obviously lots of details in between. So uh, talking on any subject um, and even romantic. And I think that's another thing is just knowing that, you know, when do you have those kinds of conversations and in what space we, we evaluate, you know, public displays of affection. What's, a, what's appropriate in, you know, in, in the mall, in the restaurant? So in the movie theater, when the lights are dark, what's appropriate? And not what you want and not what you see, but what's appropriate. Um, not what you see on TV or in the movies or on the internet. So uh, next one is trust and, you know, can you fully trust them? And what happens if you can't? And what happens if that's broken? Uh, how do we repair? Uh, what are the measurements of a trusting relationship, uh, including safety? So what are the measurements around safety when it's someone that you, you know, think you want to be romantically involved with? So as we go through, I don't know how, how much of the details you want me to share with you on each one of these, but um, what level of affection is appropriate for those kinds of extended family members? So in, in the curriculum alone, it also talks about, well, what about that weird uncle that always seems to hug you, you know, too long? So we do get into a lot of, you know, uh, unique and personal experiences. So that does open that, that up for discussion. Uh, inevitably, someone has somebody in their life that they feel uncomfortable around. So for whatever reason, it may not be touch. It may not, it's just how they say things, how they tease me all the time is so annoying. And I don't know how, so I avoid them. And um, so as you start getting to these further um, circles or further relationship roles, you start to see how do I deal or cope with, and as the holidays are coming upon us, you start to see more and more of these family members. Um, so, by the time we sit down and have these discussions with them, they'll probably have more current experience. Uh, the holidays seem to provide that to us. Uh, generally trustworthy, but just because they're family, does that mean they're people you should grant your trust to or they're people who need to earn your trust? So we obviously break that down the difference there. Do you give trust or do you earn trust? And what are some of those behaviors that earn trust? So how do we make that visual? So in, in the curriculum, there's a lot of videos where we watch a video together and then we discuss it and say, okay, well, this is what was weird to me or what I noticed and how did you interpret their reaction? And so there's a lot of different levels. And then we'll have someone share an example of something that they experienced and that they can ask for advice on how to deal with that. I don't think this is in this building independence group. I don't think it's far fetched at all. I think they're going to be very comfortable um, because most of them are already bringing these kinds of things up um, in in you know context of whatever the topic is. So, uh, yellow handshake acquaintances. Do you know them by name? So I will quiz people. Well, yeah, they're my friend. Well, what's their name? Well, where do they live? So there's an itemized list of how does that person, you know, become a friend? How do they become someone you truly know? Well, I just get my groceries there. Okay, but you don't know their name without seeing their tag. So how close are you really? What do you really know about them outside of that location? So what is the topic that you should talk about in line? And how long should you stay there? So that's another thing that I think is pretty common is, well, when do you break off that communication? When does it end? 
and what is a standard you know operating procedure so i work with a young man right now who he'll always say um hi i'm fine goodbye because he knows he's supposed to greet you he knows you're gonna say hey how are you doing and he knows he needs to close the conversation. So hi, I'm fine, goodbye. So now we just gotta slow down a little bit and kind of wait for the other pieces in between, but he's got exactly what his rote uh, communication is gonna be. So developing the rote communication is often very, you know, very, uh, uh, how would I put it, important for them. So one thing I learned very young in life was if I really don't have time to talk, I don't say, hi, how are you doing? I say, hello, good to see you. Because there's a difference. You do not have time to hear 30 minutes of how they're really doing. So if you don't ask the question, you didn't give the open-ended, let me tell you what's been going on in my life. So because if you ask, you should be interested in the outcome. So I use examples like that. And so how do we, you know, role play that within the group, I think is another aspect. And so there's always someone in every group that has, you know, that as something that they're working on as a goal for themselves. So when we evaluate self, we talk about what are your social goals? How can you not fall into that trap? Or how can you not be the person who's trapping someone else? So it is, very, it is a very important skill to have. Uh, and on Zoom, it's harder to cut people off. So it's a lot easier in person because you have all of the, all of the, uh, the body language and uh, social context visually to see if someone's interested or not. So you can change personal space. But on Zoom, it's all the same. So there are nuances to that. I know on FaceTime, I'll see people set their phone down and just go do something else. And the other person on the other end is just chatting away. So isn't it better to be honest and open? So I've seen my own kids do it and say, ha ha, they're still talking 20 minutes later and I left set my phone down. It's like, mm, that's not okay. That is not how you do this. So, you know, they have a goal, but now you have a goal too. So it's funny to point out other people's you know, needs, but it's not funny when you realize you have one also. So th those are just ways that we can deal with you know, how people uh, approach and respond to different challenges that other communication partners have without trying to create another challenge for yourself. So uh, we talked about uh, people who are known by their job or business. Um, you know, what are some of those topics that are just you know, surface, weather, how's life, how's work. Um, so trying to categorize how, what are the topics that you have in common that you can briefly discuss and move on rather than getting into something that's very deep and important and they would feel poor uh, if they, you know, had to cut you off. So uh, one of the other things I like to use here is for people to say, do you have time to talk? It's such a great way to start a conversation or a telephone call rather than just saying, hey, how you doing? I missed you so much. Let's just keep going and just rattle off for five minutes before you realize, oh, they're busy. All relationship skills. So um, talked about medical touch um, and then total strangers. I worked with a young man one of the very first times I ever used this program. I worked with a young man. He was in his uh, early teens. Uh, he was attracted to blonde females. The challenge was he had no discriminatory ability to tell the difference between an attractive five-year-old and an attractive 70-year-old. So we had to really break that down. And we would go to magazines. And we would cut pictures out of magazines and we would look at who is an appropriate, you know, social partner. Is this five-year-old an appropriate social partner? Is this 70-year-old an appropriate social partner? Because he was looking for a girlfriend. So 
not to be biased, but to be realistic, we had to create a criteria uh, or a list of uh, inquiries that he would use as he met people. Hi, my name is, what's your name? You know, how old are you? Or, you know, what are you doing today? But eventually getting to the details and we let him pick a couple of questions and we picked a couple of questions. And so he always wanted to know, do they have pets? Because if you don't have pets, I'm really not interested. And so we were, you have to be in, you know, this age range. So you have to find a way to get to how old you are. So we looked at it as to who's in certain environments at what times during the day. And so that helped him to try to break it down. If I'm looking for someone to be a partner, where are these someones at what time during the day? And who could you omit really quickly? So if it's during school hours, most likely if you're at the mall during school hours, there are no partners for you. So how do we break down these, these details as to where you look? Then we would say, because he would ask every blonde female he saw, we couldn't get out of them all because there were so many. So when we would go, we have, we're going to buy two things and you get to talk to introduce yourself to three new females. Be selective. You only got three. So once you use up your three, we're leaving. And that was really stressful for him to say, oh gosh, does she meet the criteria? So it gave him a lot more value in figuring out in his head, where would she fall in this criteria before I go talk to her? Rather than talking to 30 females, he would just go talk to three. So we started to define the criteria using strangers in magazines and saying, okay, which ones of these are your favorites? Why are they your favorites? What do you know about them just by looking? So a lot of it was, we had to teach the difference. Are they wearing makeup? Are they not wearing makeup? So what are some of these criteria? Do they have a wedding ring? Are they carrying car keys? Um, you know, all of these things. They have a backpack. So it was quite unique in that time frame. Again, we're talking, you know, late 80s, early 90s, where we were using this visual tool to try to pick. So he would pick three strangers out here on this far circle and every time he introduced himself the stranger would come off the circle until he asked three and that was just one of the ways that we started to avoid having negative interactions or inappropriate interactions with five-year-old blonde girls to be honest so uh any questions about this reference guide Anything I can fill in for you? Okay, I'll move on to the next. So circles are really divided into three main categories. So the first one is that social distance. So what are those comfortable spaces? And if you don't feel it, so a lot of people feel, so one of the tests we've always used in circles when you can do it in person is to line people up and have them walk forward until they feel like people are too close to them. So whatever that is that arms reach, is it further? Are people actually waiting for you to really come close? Uh, we use examples of you know, two individuals and one person keeps backing up and every time that person backs up, the other person steps forward. So not picking up those social cues and being able to identify you know, what it is and why uh, and how people feel. We identify the difference between professional settings and social settings and public settings, um, and obviously with the different levels of relationships. So finding people who will tell you the truth about what are the social distance boundaries that you break. So if you're really good at it, well then you might become the person who tells other people the truth. So if that's a strength for you, how can you help other people? And what, what things could you say for them or provide them without being you know, challenging, such as, you know, I don't see you as well when you're that close. Can you stay, take a step back, please? So if you put it onto something you know, where it's a medical need 
or something that's a part of who you are, but non-adversarial, uh, that's one tool you can give people. Likewise, just showing them that arm's reach is most common in social settings. So if you reach out and touch them, you might be too close. So it doesn't mean that you're gonna test that either. So that's just another one of those nuances. So one of the biggest categories, social distance. Uh, social distance when you're sitting on a bus. Social distance when you're going into the restroom and there's a bunch of urinals. And which one do you use based on which one is already occupied? These are things that most people just don't talk about, but there are unwritten rules to these things. So is that in the curriculum? No, but is it an issue for many people I know? Absolutely. So that's why you have to individualize as you see me harp on this over and over and over. Um, because that's the thing, your knowledge of who these individuals are is like your best skill, knowing what they run into. So if you can gain that information prior to teaching, then you'll do a much better job of instructing the curriculum. Uh, relationship building. So we talk about like, what types of things do we have in common? So how much time do you, do you spend with people to say that you have a good relationship? Are there deal breakers within the relationship? Things that, you know what, if they say this or dress like that or, you know, believe in this, that, you know, we're not going to have a relationship, that that's just a deal breaker. How do you, because I think one of the, one of the significant challenges for individuals who carry diagnoses is that ability to uh, not only have a relationship, but continue and maintain a relationship. So if, even if that requires facilitation, how do I get people to help me to maintain relationships? And how do I develop that trust in people to help me to become better at relationships? So I find that that ongoing, this is something that none of us ever perfect because they're all different communication partners. So in order to perfect a relationship with somebody, they have to be someone you see so regularly and you know so intimately. But most of the individuals I support don't have a ton of people who are these kinds of unpaid friends. That's why this is so important to teach. They don't pick it up through osmosis. So even if they went all through school and they graduated high school, a lot of times those friends they had in high school are not coming over. They're not hooking up. They're not going out. Well, it's not because they wouldn't, but that relationship wasn't built on that level. So how do you continue that, you know, that relationship? Uh, I work with a lot of individuals who don't want, they don't want all their relationships to be with other people, be with other people with diagnoses. So they have to then find common interests with people who don't. So what is your passion? What is your hobby? And how do you get into that um, without, you know, without the, the categoric diagnosis as being one of those factors? Many other people don't even know that's not their concern, but I know many of that is a concern for them. They don't want to be isolated to a certain population. They want to diversify. So uh, the next one of the top three is the related topics in sexuality education. Now, I put this, this big, bold uh, statement at the bottom because circles is not sex education. And hopefully, you obviously haven't picked that up from our discussion so far. Uh, however, personal safety, uh, interpersonal contact, social media, personal values, those always arise within the discussion. So when we talk about sexuality education, it gives them the opportunity to ask questions. It gives them the opportunity to be confused and share the details. Well, I feel like this, or I really want to have a significant other, and I don't know how to do it. 
Uh, I see, you know, when these people are, you know, making out in public and how it makes me feel either positive or negative and how do I address that? Um, so sexuality education is, is many, many topics, but sex education is not what this is. So we don't go into the details um, with regards to that. If that were ever something that's presented in one of my classes, obviously I defer them and have them you know, discuss something more personally, uh, find other people or identify in their circle who are the people that are best to talk to about that, but make sure that it's not unaddressed. So I think one, one of the unfortunate realities is that sexuality and questions regarding it are just um, not open for a lot of people. Um, whether it's value-based, whether it's just discomfort and having that conversation, um, we don't want to uh, open up a discussion where we don't have all the answers uh, or we don't have um, a good answer, meaning a positive one that's going to make them happy. So often it's like, oh, well, go ask so-and-so or, you know, we, we try to redirect or make light of it. So what I try not to do is um, avoid someone's serious concern or interest. So, um, but I also want you all to know that if you have someone who attends one of these classes with me, that if they ask that question, I'm certainly going to follow up with them or redirect them to the appropriate source and make sure that their question gets, an gets answered. Um, but we are going to cover personal sexual safety. So we are going to cover inappropriate touch and um, people getting asked for nude photos or, um, you know, sexting or um, there's so much of this kind of thing, as well as, you know, how people use their bodies to sell, whether that be products or get likes or um, how they're measuring themselves based on um, people they don't even know. Uh, and, and, and sexual in nature, or even comedy and making a fool of oneself. I mean, is that what you're trying to achieve? And, you know, uh, uh, as people recognize that, you know, how people are getting rich and famous these days or getting attention these days is really dramatic. It's not what we were accustomed to. So their parents don't get it. Um, you know, this, our generation isn't familiar growing up that way. Um, so it does have a really heavy price to pay, I think, on them, regardless of diagnosis or not. Um, really attending to people's personal values. So what, what do you think about, you know, marriage? What do you think about um, same-sex couples? You know, it's, it's a part of your environment. It's a part of what you're going to witness. So what's, you know, what's inappropriate? and how to address that, um, you know, and, and not staring at people and, you know, all of those different factors when people are different, look different, what have you. Um, so there's a lot of information. It's, I, I don't even know how to, to summarize it as I was just typing up this um, PowerPoint for you all. Cause I was like, oh, just the, just the things I've experienced with individuals uh, could take weeks and weeks and weeks, so. Hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from in a general sense, but there's a lot of individualized questions that uh, are delivered and a lot of opinions. So you have very opinionated people in the world. And I think being able to speak your opinion today is more encouraged, uh, even when it's inappropriate. So how do you, uh, how do you educate and support people by being open and wanting to have a voice yet when to do it and how to do it. So a lot more details within that. I think we're all working on that as a society. So um, they're not alone. So we go into a relationship identifier training and I did touch on this a bit, but really truly measuring, quantifying, how long have you known someone? So as you're measuring those, you know, the three T's, what is what are some of these criteria for trust? Well, how long should you know someone to trust them? I met them on the internet. And we've talked for a year. Well, have you seen them? You know, so there's a lot more of these variables today than there's ever been. 
because you can have a relationship and not really know somebody today. And we've had lots of issues with those kinds of things occurring within the population that I support, um, all the way to where they've met them and disappeared. So it can be highly dangerous. Um, but even when it's you know your friends who you do know, or your relatives that you do know, so what, what are the things you keep secret versus what are the things you need to tell people about? Uh, how often do you see them? So what is the frequency? So especially when you're getting into, you know, friendships, significant others, best friends, well, how often do you actually spend time together? So uh, I know individuals who are like, well, you know, we've been dating for a long time. Well, yeah, you know, we want to get married. Well, what does that look like to you? And uh, how often do you really spend time with them? So have you vacationed together? So when you think about, well, what is the longest time you've ever spent with that person? If it's four hours, that's probably not long enough. So there's a lot of criteria that you have to measure in determining the frequency and intensity of which you know or see this individual. Uh, how many common bonds do you have? So what do you truly like about one another? And what, what kind of activities do you share? Do you share values? Do you share beliefs? And then I mentioned earlier about the deal breakers. So how well do you really know them? So I, I, I use a list of questions and we just ask this list. And if you don't know the answers to all these questions, well, guess what? You don't really know them. So it's really black and white. If you don't know the answer to these, you don't know them. Um, and how deep are your feelings for them? And what does that mean? So I love them more than anything. Well, more than chocolate? Well, chocolate's pretty awesome. Okay, well, then maybe not. How about your dog? So when you think about, you know, what are the things that are most important to you? Well, if there was an argument between your mother and this person, which one would you side with? Tough question. Regardless of the outcome, often, if you're being honest, you can say which way you would lean which means you've got a lot more relationships to develop. Uh, the last one here is how safe. And so do you know, meaning how with, with quantifying all of these categories, that summarizes how safe you're with them. So obviously if they're on the internet and you've never really been with them, you're not safe. Safety is your distance. So they've never asked you to do anything inappropriate. Okay, so you're safe at a distance. But what if they're in the room? What if you meet at a park? Now are you safe? Well, you don't know that. So how do you, how do you approach those subjects? Who goes with you? So having these kinds of examples becomes essential. I have a friend whose son is going to be turning 18 at the end of the summer. His girlfriend is in North Carolina. He's met her once. Her parents flew her out here to spend a week with them. Values are different than mine. It's not wrong. It's just different. But when he wanted to go there, his parents said no. But now he's looking to go to school in North Carolina, because that's where she's at. So how do you weigh out these kinds of decisions based on someone you know mostly online when you've never even been to their house, yet you're making a decision on your next four years? So I see Brenda shaking her head. It's like, well, that's how I felt too, but I'm not in his circle. So I'm not someone who's advising him. So I have to say that this is just one of those scenarios that comes up as to how is this decision made and what are the values within each person's decision? What do your parents think? What do your best friends think? What do the, her parents think? You know, obviously you guys are different because just the values between those two families are different. And now you're going to move across the country because that's where she's at. 
this is not an uncommon story. A lot of people are meeting people online and they're making pretty radical decisions that again, I, I, I go generational and say, wow, I never uh, had that option. So it's hard for me to think it through based on my health and safety values. So all of these things are really important things to talk about, even if they're just, you know, across the city line and you talk to them all the time. But having these relationship identifiers is super important. So obviously we get into physical safety, um, you know, manipulation, um, someone who borrows money too much, where do they fit on the, you know, on the relationship scale. Um, there's a lot of different behaviors here. So you may know them forever, but what if they never pay you back? What if they invite you to things that you're paying for and then they don't invite you to anything else? What if they invite you because you drive? So there's a lot of these different kinds of relationship identifiers that we use in this particular curriculum. So this is what it looks like. I know it's a little grainier than I thought because I stretched it out. Um, but you can see here, as you have the private circle, the hug circle, et cetera, you see the significant other or the love interest in the heart there. Um, as you notice, as you get further out, this person has, oh, by the way, photos. So the, the curriculum comes with line drawings, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, so one thing I do encourage is for the individual when they're creating it is to do photos. If they're not going to write names or what have you. Um, I do photos with borders. You notice these are uh, translucent. So the color of the um, different circle is represented on the color of the person that is put in there. I often will do borders around them so that you can see that people come and go and people can move through based on different areas. So yeah, I trust them like a brother, but you know, we don't hug like that or what have you. So as you're getting into the, the touch talk trust, uh, I often will do three different colors. So separate the border that way for those who need it visually. Uh, the identification or the ID, here I'll be right back, is not on this one. So we use things like, a badge, badge ID that shows you that's where you would have your doctor or your therapist or your dentist or someone along those lines. Uh, your teacher uh, would fit into that category. Uh, I told you I use magazines. They like to use, you know, blanks with question marks. Um, I try to just, you know, put identifiers. If you did this, you could obviously include that person's photo later and slowly move them as they become less of an acquaintance and more of a friend as they decide about the trust issues. I've also had people who think this whole thing is childish, um, but they like all the topics. So they don't wanna do the circles itself. They're not interested in the visual, someone might see it. So you have to support them in that way as well. So I can understand that it does look childish. Sometimes it's like, well, you know, this is just a visual example because sometimes it's easier to learn things visually. So this is not something that has to leave your house or something that has to, you know, you can hide it away if you choose to do it. So a lot of options with respect to that. Um, so as you see this visually, because the one behind me is much harder to, to witness, um, one visual um, aspect of this is you can see where you're filling up circles. So you can see where deficits lie in your support structure, which to me is both a benefit and, you know, disheartening. But it, it does really give me a, a goal in helping them to, to, to gain more people in that particular role. So I also sometimes identify people as paid people versus unpaid people. And for some people, when I'm on their circle, I can be both. 
because I'm paid to do certain things, but I'm just visiting or going out to dinner because we're friends. So they can see where people actually morph into different roles. So yeah, I'm not your best friend because I'm also paid to support you, but I'm definitely a friend because we spend time together that's not paid time. So those are nuances for people. They have to, and I, I will say it again, this is my own personal belief. They have to have people in their life, friends in their life who aren't paid people. It's, it's just really difficult to understand that they wouldn't have people who like them just for them. So sometimes that's our facilitation. So this visual example helps me or motivates me to help them to get connected. Um, and so such as this building independence group that we do, I mean, I would bet that, uh, you know, not wanting to speak for all of them, but virtually all of them would say, these are my friends that, you know, these 12, 16 people that I see every Thursday night are my people. Um, they're their friends. And uh, they, a lot of them have exchanged information. So they're gonna have to put their own photos on each other's circles. Uh, and that will give us an opportunity to discuss, well, how do you move from circle to circle? How do you gain trust? How do you develop that? How do you um, address the concerns that you have with one another when things arise? So any question about the visual? I know I mentioned pets go on here as well. Uh, often we talk about if you move, you know, how to become friends with your neighbor. So how to develop relationships with people that are just in proximity to you because, and why is that valuable? And what are the risks as well? So we talked about circles beginning with self. So we make sure that they know that they're the most important person that that's part of the building blocks to relationships. Uh, we do talk about touch and evaluating all of your contact with all others. So really looking at when you touch in the right way and when you touch in the wrong way. Um, but we also address public versus private. So what, what is okay to do and what is not okay to do? I did work with a young lady just last week who had her hands in her pants in a public setting. And literally, she did not understand that that was inappropriate. She'd never been told that that's a not okay thing in the way that she would learn it. In a very concrete matter of fact, this is what people will think of you if. So the same thing that uh, the, the discussion also approached feminine hygiene. So a lot of topics will come out of this that is self-care. So, you know, if you're, if you're someone who supports people who need this kind of, you know, curriculum and information, you have to be willing to accept those hard questions and be very um, honest about it. Yes, that's something that happens. And this is, you know, who you need to talk to to address that. And yeah, there's hygiene factors and there's safety factors and there's personal private factors. And, you know, all of those things are really important. Uh, the next one is talk. So evaluate conversations and topics from formal to private. So what, what kinds of topics are okay to say at a bus stop or in a classroom or at work or, you know, what have you? I think we'll list those kinds of topics and role play those kinds of topics and, and recognize when you run out of things to say, you can't fall back on some of the things that you might say with people that you're familiar with when you're unfamiliar with the person in front of you. So I, I see that commonly as well. Uh, the last one being trust, evaluating others, safeguarding your interests. So how do you, first of all, safeguard your own interests? So how do you measure what those are? How do you choose wisely? Uh, so we really get into a very detailed evaluation of safeguarding your personal space, safeguarding your, um, your beliefs and values without being offended or offensive, um, safeguarding your, um, I'd say, self-esteem 
So how to address, you know, your feelings getting hurt and who says it and what and how to interpret it. And, you know, maybe they're still working on this too and they didn't mean to hurt your feelings or how do you repair those relationships so that you don't just, you know, omit them from your lives, etc. So um, again, as you can see, just just any one of these topics with any individual could take lots and lots of time. So you have to get around to everybody's needs and everybody's discussion and try to include as many things as you already know about them as possible. I will often uh, have conversations with people in advance and say, I've, I know this is a, is a situation that you've had. Do you mind if I bring it up in class? Um, so I'm getting people's permission to have these discussions uh, is also a very important factor. Uh, getting people willing to discuss or present, co-present, uh, makes it more of an educational topic than just a, something that came out in discussion. So it makes them more of a leader, which gives them a little more uh, clout than if they just brought it up in class or you just ask them in class without being prepared. So if you present that by saying, hey, I've, I've had a, a meeting with this person earlier and I asked them to present on this today with me, then suddenly they have a different role and people aren't gonna make fun of them or, or you know, be, be concerned about their honesty. They'll actually be more appreciative of their honesty. So I've mentioned some of these already, but circles can bring up concerns. So one is that people teasing and belittling and especially talking about cyberbullying. This is something that I think a lot of young people experience and don't share and they personalize it. Uh, and it really, I perceive damages them quite significantly when they have such honor and respect for people's opinions who do not matter in their lives. So one of, I find one of the more important things to address is whose opinion and statements really matter in your life. Who should you be trying to please and impress? So again, measuring that, quantifying that, these individuals on your peripheral are not the people you're supposed to be trying to impress their opinions are irrelevant. So um, even putting that on a separate you know, list saying, hey, I have a lot of acquaintances, but their opinions do not matter to me. Maybe they're friends, maybe they're contacts, but that's not where we connect. We do not connect on you know, style and or religion or you know, um, politics or whatever it is. And I find, again, that is pretty significant today where people will gang up on other people um, and, and hurt them and hurt their beliefs and they don't know how to address it or respond to it. Um, and thus they just own it and personalize it. That takes you to private thoughts and ideas. Um, the first thing I think about is when it's private thoughts is you know how your perception of self, but what are your dreams and what are, what are the things you want for yourself? Uh, what are the ideas you have that you don't commonly share? Or you don't have an outlet for that. So sometimes it's finding groups or individuals where you can have that conversation, where you can really be you. Not everyone I know has that designed for them, where they're allowed to be them, where they're allowed to chase dreams, where they're allowed to just do whatever they want. Um, Brenda, if I may, you were mentioning your son, Bob, singing. And, you know, had you not told me that, you know, what a great way to express and enjoy and what a wonderful thing to, um, to pursue. And, you know, if, if he doesn't have the outlet for that outside of the house, well, how can he share it with anybody else? And how can anyone else appreciate him for having that um, desire and fun and ownership and, you know, and we all, those of us who do know him know he has a great sense of humor and he's a, you know, lover of people and, you know, all of those things, but I didn't know that he would want to sing in public. So, you know, sometimes people have private thoughts and, and activities that they would really 
uh, enjoy have the opportunity or exposure to doing it. So you have to have people in your life who will support those ideas. So, um, so what, whatever private thoughts those are, you have to have a forum, um, an individual to share those things with. Uh, personal value and depression. So I, I, I do find that a lot of people are measuring their own personal value, especially as these young adults, they measure it on friendships, they measure it based on work, uh, COVID it took a lot out of them because of isolation, um, whether it be isolation from social or isolation from employment or, um, you know, everything down to the paid professionals not coming. So uh, a lot of uh, lost relationship time occurred. And I have witnessed that becoming very depressive. So in, in support of that, this is, you know, a new way for them to look at it and say, well, I've got to get involved. I have got to get myself out there. Uh, I have got to find the people who can help me to address it and to get me connected. So it does open a forum for those kinds of discussions and concerns. And sometimes it brings about sadness. Um, the next one, I think one of the most significant is abuse and trauma. So I've had in these types of um, educational settings, people say, hey, I've been abused or I've been um, touched sexually inappropriately. And um, because you're offering them a forum to to discuss that maybe they've never experienced before. So, and, and you're putting it in such a, a matter of fact context when no one else may talk about it in such a way, all the way to providing visuals and, and you know, discussing these measures of trust and measures of touch um, to where it does bring up the past um, for a lot of people. So um, if you have, you know, young people going to attend or you're going to use this um, curriculum for them, be prepared um, that they may share something that they haven't shared before. Um, the next one being trauma. So trauma can come in any form. Uh, anything that they've experienced that they really, you know, haven't gotten through um, or haven't had the ability to, to successfully communicate about in a way where they feel like they're making progress. So hopefully it's not just a re-triggering activity, but it's really a processing of information and finding support and communication and coping skills through that. Um, that's one of the ways where you identify and connect them with people who uh, there may be lacking in their circle so that those kinds of uh, things are important. I know one individual I started working with recently, we meet at the gym. So we're actually, you know, we're doing two things at one time. So we are communicating and coping and counseling at the same time that we're working out and we don't necessarily have to look at each other. And so by having that ability to de-stress physiologically at the same time you're talking about stressful events, has become a really good match, especially in a very quiet, um, unattended gym, uh, which many are less attended today than they once were. So just an, another way to you know, figure out how you can get multiple things involved. And now that individual goes to the gym by himself because he has a routine and because he knows people at the gym that aren't paid people, they're just people there as well as the people who supply his, you know, um, you know, gym support, who check him in, who talk to him, who, you know, come around every day and say hi. So it has really created many things that now we have other people to put on a circle because of this little activity where we started meeting in a different location rather than meeting in an office. So. Uh, lastly on this list is a loss of relationships, divorce and death. When there, there's no way to approach relationships and life without appro approaching broken relationships and loss and death. So it is just a guarantee, whether it you know be someone's loving pet all the way to, you know, very 
very intimate people in their personal circle. Um, that, of course, brings about discussions of uh, re religion and spirituality and, you know, what you believe and how you cope with loss, um, you know, talking about good things as well as painful. Um, so death, obviously, for most is a more difficult, but divorce, especially when it's current for people or they haven't addressed it, um, most often it's not them in divorce, but that's a possibility, but it's often the divorce of parents, grandparents, siblings, etc., where they feel like they've lost somebody or um, maybe the person they have is not the one they wish they had still had a relationship with and uh, how that's difficult to try to manage without hurting, you know, someone else's feelings. Um, so, so many, many of these kinds of topics or concerns will come up, even though you're trying to do very, very good work. So I don't want to try to scare anyone away from this use, because if any one of you are already burying these kinds of issues yourself and not talking about them, it's probably not best practice. So just because you open up these discussions and topics does not make it bad. It just means you have to be prepared to support somebody a little more thoroughly. So that's exactly why we thought it would be great to have this discussion tonight or have this presentation, is to know that these are very, very important discussions to have. Um, there are people out here willing to do it, um, but we also have to um, elicit the support from everyone around to have communication, to discuss what might have happened in class. So having each other's contact information and saying they're really struggling with this or at least getting their permission to do so, um, so that they're getting supports outside of just a, uh, uh, in this case, an internet Zoom course. So what will they need? Well, they're gonna need photos of family if they have them and friends. They're gonna need obviously the, the circle sheet that I showed you. They're gonna need markers if they wanna color it. They might need magazines if they wanna cut out different things, interests, likes, people, um, strangers, uh, those kinds of things. They might need to print things off of websites for their doctor if they want them. So just that kind of support they may or may not need the technological support. They may need printer ink. Uh, they can use lots of different things. Um, they may need after the fact support and discussion and outlets for that. Uh, I was talking to you about the young man um, with his father. And so they're, they're having weekly meetings, weekly family meetings about what they're learning, about what they're doing different, about the problems that they experience with each other and others. Um, that they never had before. So when you have these kinds of um, experiences in your life and you don't have a forum for which to communicate them, um, then you know it's not going to be easy to get through it or understand it um, until much, much later in life, even if you're lucky. So um, creating these kinds of uh, formats, tools, et cetera, uh, is what I think we all benefit from. So especially the ones who can't initiate it themselves. So uh, lastly, we do, we're going to be presenting this at Building Independence, which is 6 to 8 p.m. Eight, 18 years and older is the group. We do ask for their maturity, um, but we also ask them to have a good time. So, and I'm, I, I think and because they come and they're not paid for the most part, they usually have a pretty darn good time. Um, and they do exchange information and they do make, you know, relationships outside of the, the, the Zoom class. Um, how is that? Was that thorough? What questions do you all have? Um, what can I share with you? Obviously, if you uh, want to have this PowerPoint as something to review, you're welcome to it. Um, there's lots of uh, videos and things that are out there. Everybody does it different. Um, they will not name the curriculum for copyright issues, I'm sure. But uh, as long as they're using it for good, I'm sure it's all wonderful. It's just, it's, it's not a tool I recommend for lay people to use because of the... Um, 
because of the death, because of the human experience. So it's, it's not your, you know, surface topics. And maybe that's what you, uh, what's that? I was going to say, it looks like John has a question. Oh yes. Go ahead, John. I'm going to, I'm going to close out this, uh, this share so I can see you all. There we go. John, your mic is off. There you go. Um, well, um, first of all, thank you for this presentation. You're actually uh, amazing. It's <laughs> in incredibly impressive. Uh, so much information. My brain is just uh, uh, swimming at this point. But uh, the, I guess... Uh, in following along with you, uh, how would I get this information incorporated with Alex and his psychologist? So maybe she could work on a lot of this stuff with him because we just don't communicate well. Alex talked to me. I don't know if he can or if it's because I'm his father, but he has an amazing psychologist and these are uh, 